Welcome, it's indisputable. I'm your host, Rashad Richie, good to be with you. We have a lot on the agenda today, breaking down news of the day. None other than Yasmin Khan, host, Global Thread Podcast, the breakdown contributor, extraordinary individual. Always a fascinating analysis. Top story of the day, Donald Trump can add one more element to his title, profit. Here it is. There's virtually no doubt that FBI Director Comey and the great, great special agents of the FBI will be able to collect more than enough evidence to garner indictments against Hillary Clinton and her inner circle, despite her efforts to disparage them and to discredit them. If she were to win this election, it would create an unprecedented constitutional crisis. In that situation, we could very well have a sitting president under felony indictment and ultimately a criminal trial. And ultimately a criminal trial, he says. Now, I know his prophecy, which happened in 2016, was a little off. He said Hillary Clinton, he meant himself, Donald Trump. But here's the irony beyond that. Republicans used to love them some police. I mean, they loved the police. It didn't matter what the police did. We had to support and back the blue. Black lives matter, no, 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 blue lives matter. When we talked about targeted investigations, no. You just have to follow the rules. When unarmed black men were shot and killed, no. They should have simply complied. When the criminal justice system did not work for those who could not afford afford representation, we were told, but the system overall is still the best system on the planet. And all of a sudden, when one well-connected, politically powerful, wealthy white male is investigated by the FBI, Marjorie Taylor Greene and others have launched defund the police, shirts and hats. They are now antithetical to law enforcement. They are saying off with his head, politically speaking, as it relates to the current FBI director. Let me remind you of an article not too long posted. Former President Donald Trump wants to defund the FBI, it says, and the Department of Justice. Republicans alleging the FBI and the DOJ have been weaponized against them. I want you to put that on a shelf for just a moment. Have held hearings featuring disgruntled former agents and also are gaming out ways to restrict funding for federal law enforcement agencies. And now Governor Ron DeSatan of Florida, governor who is running for president has pledged to fire the FBI director on his first day in office. Now this is adverse to the police, correct? When Black Lives Matter said pay attention because the police are not for us. Pay attention because injustices are happening within the industry of law enforcement. No Republican paid attention to it. As a matter of fact, they opposed legislation to create transparency and progress. But now when there's a legitimate investigation and to an individual who is actually illegitimate himself, there's a big problem. I want to remind people of one absolute criticism that is a hypocrisy. So they criticized the DOJ for investigating Donald Trump and other political figures. And they say, this is weaponizing the federal government, the FBI, the DOJ against us. You all literally put a president in office whose entire campaign was about weaponizing the FBI against Hillary Clinton and others. You all chanted, lock her up. You all cheered him along when he said that he would do exactly that. When he was down with the program, hell, when he was president of the United States, the man got another foreign head of state on the phone 
and told him to investigate an American citizen. You all had no problems with these things until the chickens came home to roost on your front doorstep. There's more. Forget for a moment that the FBI director, Christopher Wray, along with most confirmed director since J. Edgar Hoover, they're Republican. He's a Republican. The arguably more important part of the declaration made even by DeSantis about the current FBI director, which came during an interview on Fox News with federal prosecutor turned Congressman Trey Gowdy, is the DeSantis view that Republicans should completely reevaluate the American justice system. Whoa, isn't that something? Now, I want to remind everyone, only left leaning political figures or left leaning social leaders in this country have actually been killed by the American government. Count Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. among them. They have been put under surveillance illegally, utilized, they utilize tactics on becoming of any type of officer against left, left leaning and progressive figures. Republican presidents have accepted the canard that the DOJ and FBI are independent. They are not independent agencies, DeSantis said. He would therefore clean house and fire people at the agencies. Former President Donald Trump's long raging anger at the FBI has now infected the party at large and could soon have very real consequences for federal law enforcement. Not the least of which is that even presidential candidates, not named Trump, are promising to exert more partisan control over law enforcement. I remember there was a debate years ago about firing an FBI director. Can it be done? Of course it can be done. Uh, Many presidents have done it, not a lot, not most, but many. And the reality is, It should be separate and independent, but it is not. The only thing that is somewhat separate is the fact that an FBI director is appointed to a 10 year term, but they can be disappointed by president at any time. I just find these things to be quite, well, let's just say hypocritical. All right, my dear sister, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it just goes to show that somebody like Trump doesn't actually care about the Constitution or what did he call it? The unprecedented constitutional crisis that he was referring to. Because here he is doing the exact thing that he said would be disastrous for the country. And as you mentioned right now, there's a hearing with Chris Ray, the FBI director. And they were saying that House Republicans, when they don't like the outcome of an investigation, their move is to investigate the investigators and it just keeps things prolonged and it wastes taxpayer money and it confuses the public. It's just sad that we have these things on tape and Trump supporters either won't think anything of the hypocrisy of it all or they'll just excuse it and say that it's different with him because Trump in their eyes gets all of the exceptions because you know he's essentially what did you call him uh, their prophet, right? Yeah, yeah. well for some he's their Messiah. All -hmm. right, we shall follow the hypocrisy as always, okay. Very sad story, black woman disabled is denied assistance because the clerk did not believe her. Here's the video. Y'all, when I say I don't even get on social media and I don't even do all of this, but I'm at 2007 Brownsboro World World, and I'm trying to get gas. My son's in the car with me, like I cannot physically walk. If you know me, you know I'm in the bush, you know I use assistance, I have hand controls. The lady literally just told me, I don't know how to pump gas. I'm like, come on, like it's self-explanatory, self-explanatory, self-explanatory. Like I just need you to put the gas in there and I can show you what to do. Like she gonna holler, well if you driving, you can walk right. And I'm trying to explain to her like, I cannot walk, I'm paralyzed. She gonna holler, how are you driving? Once again, I'm using assistance, why does that even matter? It's a whole wheelchair stand right here on this 
gas pump. So that means if I need assistance, you're supposed to help me. When I say being in a wheelchair, this is the I heard that I hate the most. And then I asked the bitch for her name. She's going to holler. I ain't got no name. Why don't you walk in the store and find out? Like, rude. Put up the picture for a mass. You know, I really get. I really get upset when people try to take the dignity away from another human being. A paralyzed black woman is outraged because a gas station employee in Louisville, Kentucky denied her normative assistance. Her name is Zakia Wright. She says she went to Thornton's gas station on 2007 Brownsboro Road on July 9th. She was with her young son. And the white female employee, according to her pictured there, refused to pump Wright's gas. This is a violation of federal law. Let me break that down first. The Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, requires self-service gas stations to provide equal access to their customers with disabilities. If necessary to provide access, gas stations must, quote, provide refueling assistance upon the request of an individual with a disability, a service station or convenience store is not required to provide such service at any time that it is operating on a remote control basis with a single employee, but is encouraged to do so even in that case, if feasible. It continues, let patrons know through appropriate signs that customers with disabilities can obtain refueling assistance by either honking or otherwise signaling an employee. Provide the refueling assistance without any charge beyond self service price. In a follow up video and follow up videos, Ms. Wright explained that she contacted lawyers but could not afford a retainer fee. She also stated that she reached out to the corporate office for Thornton's gas station and was told the video surveillance of the incident could only be released to a lawyer requesting it. She revealed the name of the employee as Vicky, but it could not be confirmed. She mentioned that an officer was called to the scene, but told her that he could not file a police report because, and I quote, no crime took place and it was a civil matter. The Americans with Disabilities Act is a law, sir. The officer did help her pump the gas. Uh, now, according to Thornton's and according to what she said, Thornton said, they will not release the video unless it is requested by an attorney. Well, uh, an attorney will be requesting that video on my behalf today. And I want that damn video. If that's your prerequisite, you got it. There's more. Atlanta Black Star. Reached out to Thornton's acquiring by the incident, but the company has not responded to media requests as of Wednesday afternoon. Right alleged they told her an investigation is simply ongoing. Let's put up a GoFundMe. This is to help her retain a lawyer and physical therapy operations. If you are able, I encourage you to make a contribution to this GoFundMe account. Uh, let's keep this up for just a moment. I want to explain because sometimes people ask, well, what does she need a GoFundMe account for? Uh, this case may not be a big money maker. It could, and it definitely could not. But the case can definitely change some things. It can set new precedent. It can hold the company accountable. It can provide the legal framework so that things like this don't happen in the future. And attorneys, will usually require a retainer for cases that may not be money makers for them. So this is why she's raising money. All right, it is a damn shame that something like this happened, the insensitivity of this worker. 
based on the allegations of the customer. And by the way, I believe the customer wholeheartedly. Ma'am, I'm sorry that you went through this. You do have a village supporting you. I want you to feel the love this week, next week and beyond. My dear sister, thoughts here. Yeah, so according to the cop, um, from what we know at least, uh, there wasn't a crime committed here, but I guess we'll see, we'll have more insight on that once the video is released. But you know, apart from that, something that stood out to me about all of this was that it really speaks to the way we treat each other. Yeah, you know, there's a level of human decency and like what you were talking about, human dignity that needs to be preserved. And all of that's kind of lacking in our modern interactions. And I think a big part of that, apart even from you know, social and societal and racial, economic, political divides, etc. Is that the way we live our lives these days doesn't really allow for much interaction with each other. It's so easy to live your life with minimal engagement with others. You know, we self isolate quite a bit these days in modern America. You know, you can order your groceries online, you can self serve at a gas station, you can even order a Starbucks drink from an app and then just go pick it up at the window. You know, we work from home, we don't walk, we drive everywhere. We just don't meet and engage with other people like we used to. And it's turning us all into these isolated weirdos who have just forgotten the basics of human decency. And I think it manifests in situations like this one. Yeah, we will give you the update when it's guaranteed to come. All right, man tries to carjack people, ends up jumping off of the bridge, injures himself greatly. Here's a video, okay? So you can see the frantic behavior of an individual attempting to carjack more people to escape. He's running and causing a significant disturbance. And then he eventually, after trying to carjack, does the unthinkable. This lasted um, for at least a few minutes. And it was, well, not pretty. Some of the pictures that we have from this scene, it shows um, an individual who was on a gurney because it looks as if he could not walk after this. All right, let me give you as much background um, as we can. All right, so the uh, a Lyft driver was stabbed um, and he was stabbed by a passenger who tried to steal his black Tesla on the FDR drive in lower Manhattan on Tuesday, cops and police sources said. The driver had a knife pulled on him in the attempted carjacking as he was headed south on the parkway near Manhattan Bridge at about 2.45 PM. That's according to police and other sources. The knife wielding rider stabbed him, tried to carjack two other drivers and then jumped out of the car and off the FDR to the roadway below in an attempt to escape, police said. The victim was taken to Bellevue Hospital where he's listed in stable condition according to the cops. The suspect identified as Ishmael English 20 was taken to the same hospital and was in stable condition according to the police. English was charged with attempted murder, attempted robbery, reckless endangerment and four counts and criminal possession of a weapon according to the NYPD. Um, something like this obviously is, is very random for somebody to drive it down the road and they see a person trying to carjack them or a Lyft driver uh, being assaulted, uh, being brutally assaulted with a knife. Things like this, well, they happen and it's bad when it does. And the person who did it has been apprehended and will face justice. Uh, we highlight stories like this to remind people to stay on notice. It is a sad reality, but you gotta keep your head on a swivel. Even on express where you may need to keep your windows up, keep it moving. I'm glad that nobody died. All right, thoughts? Yeah, you know, people are just trying to earn a living and get on with their days. We're all struggling and hustling out here together. But whenever 
things like this happen, there's always a push for more policing and more monitoring. And at the very least, people are less likely to engage with one another or use public services. And I don't blame them for the record, I'm a very small woman. I have to be very careful and very aware when I'm out, especially when I'm out by myself. But unfortunately, crimes like this are tough to prevent without taking a big picture societal approach. Addressing things like mental health, yes, but also poverty and the things contributing to general feelings of unhappiness and inadequacy in this country. And of course, that's a much bigger and a much yeah. more political endeavor than say just putting dash cams on every lift vehicle. But that's what needs to happen. Everything has a cause and effect relationship. You never get away from it. All right, we got more on the other side. It's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We got a lot of show. I, I appreciate everybody who opines, all right, thank you. Uh, we have a new, I have a new op-ed. It is in rollingout.com. Uh, this is about America's hypocrisy and what we're gonna do about it. All right, America's hypocrisy and what we're gonna do about it. I break down everything from the recent Supreme Court ruling, affirmative action, America's fascination with lying about race, and also some options for Democrats to consider in the future. We're dealing with Republican insanity and Democratic apathy. It's a bad combination. We'd love for you to get that as soon as you can. All right, and, and we have updated our tip line, okay? So the tip line is back, open full throttle. Submission guidelines are avoid sending stories that have been already reported on unless, unless there's a new element or perhaps something they missed. Two, include any photos, videos, and documentation that relate to the story. It helps our production team ensure that we take it from beginning to end to give it to you right. And three, give a maximum of one or two paragraphs of the most crucial information in your story. Just a reminder, we are not able to tell a novel, but we can tell a story. The injustice is what we look to explore and to remedy, all right? I appreciate you in advance, okay. We got some good comments, let me read them. Next TYT reporter, so the FBI is weaponized against Trump, but it's also going after Antifa members who attacked the Capitol on January 6th. Um, do I get this correct? That's, that's the narrative, right? Yeah, that's it right there. Uh, by the flavor, flavor called pop, indictment season, baby. <laughs> it's so damn ironic, the man ran on the platform of indicting a presidential contender. Okay, and C. Michael Henson, thank you, C. Michael. Uh, he says, I was eating out for lunch yesterday while watching Indisputable on my phone. A brother walked past my table, saw you on my phone and said, Dr. Richie is the truth. Winston Salem, North Carolina watches your show. Well, thank you, Winston Salem. And I appreciate you, C. Michael, for being so supportive, brother. And we got time for one more, okay. Uh, Brenda Kennery, welcome to Indisputable. Thank you so much for your support. Look forward to the journey. Got something for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish a Karen would. You want to call the police on them for having a barbecue on a Sunday? You feel free. Back off. I'm going to tell them there's an African American man threatening my life. Good night, man. You're on the card. Good. Hey, yo. My money. Take care of the. The blocking lane. Take care of people. Take care of your own way. We are. Don't ask. Then why are they dead? Why? Yeah, are you, you want to talk dead? like that? You care about them. Get your no. fuck out of here, man. No. You're wasting my time. Don't. Don't get the insanity of this male Karen, who decided to throw dirt on a mural dedicated to indigenous women. Let's put the picture up full mass. I'm going to deal with this one directly. Protesters blocking the Brady Road landfill in South Winnipeg said their resolve is even stronger after man decided to shovel a truckload of soil and debris onto the mural near the blockade on Sunday. The blockade went up last week after the 
province refused to fund a search for Prairie Green, landfill north of Winnipeg for the remains of two indigenous women. Now keep this picture up, I wanna remind you that this man is so upset about this particular mural and the actions of the community that he put dirt and debris on his truck. I mean, he really worked a whole job, drove to the location, worked again to put dirt right there in order to make a statement. Well, I have a statement also. The city ordered those blocking the roadway to vacate by noon Monday, screw it. Who cares what they have to say, who cares what they want? I'm not going to take no for an answer anymore, said Cambria Harris, whose mother remains are believed to be at another landfill outside of the city. Let's put it up, okay? When the government decided not to respond, supporters did. Supporters swept soil and wood chips from the mural honoring missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. A man dumped the soil until the painting on Sunday. She said, Camp Morgan, which has been at the Brady Road landfill since December, originally erected the blockade to send a message, not entirely to block the landfill, which has two entrances. But after the man's act on Sunday, she and others issued a call on social media for more warriors to join those on site who said, They're ready to keep rallying for change. Harris said she wasn't at the blockade Sunday when the man in a black pickup truck dumped soil on the mural. But she saw the video of it happening, which she posted on social media. In the video, the man is seen shoveling soil and debris from the back of his truck into the mural, telling protesters, take care of your own people. After someone responds, he asks, then why are they dead? Harris questions. How he got past the security on site. Why are you so angry? I to feel like you have to take that extreme of measure of hate crime, she asked. You don't realize that you're talking to an entire group of people who have been pulverized their entire life through systematic or systemic oppression. Harris said she believes the province's decision to not support a landfill search shows that the government does not care. And she now feels she's been disrespected by all three levels of government. She said it should not have come to a measure to measures like the letter sent by the city telling protesters to shut down the blockade. I've never ever understood it. Why this kind of trauma is our fault, Harris said. The mural, a red dress with the words for our sisters written on the skirt. This was painted on the entrance road to the landfill, Ethan Boyer Way. Put him up again. He did this not because he has a legitimate gripe. He did this because he holds hate inside of his heart. And that hate has only been magnified by the highest levels of government because individuals who occupy these positions of political power, they now give people like him protection. There was a question posed earlier that actually should be examined. How did you make it past security? That part. All right. Yes, my thoughts here. Yeah, you know, people have no respect, especially not for indigenous people. Uh, there was, this reminds me of an incident. I was in line to vote recently, and one guy in front of me mentioned that he was a Native American, and the man behind me rolled his eyes and muttered to his wife, Well, I'm a Native American too. I was born here. And it just mm. sounded so willfully ignorant, which is entirely worse than just being ignorant on your own. Yep. 
But I was thinking about this recently, like why did this man go out of his way, take time out of his day to display his anger and his hate over something that doesn't even directly involve him? There are so many people who are sitting at home, a lot of them quite comfortably, nobody actively actually trying to take their rights away despite what many of them think, but they're angry. They're addicted to the anger because they've tried, they've tied so much of their own identity to it. And it it must be sad when one of your defining characteristics as a human being is how much you hate other people, especially an entire marginalized group of people. That's right. Very well said. It is connected to their own identity. They must have others they can look down upon in order to feel secure in themselves. So sad reality. All right, we're bringing you an update. We covered this initially, charges have now been dropped ironically against a woman who falsely claimed that a male was in fact being harmful. We're gonna go to the video and then I will give you the background. Here it is. No, it doesn't make me feel good uptown. I'm hey, calling, hey, 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 hey. go to uptown. Don't call me that. Go to uptown now. Yeah, you're making me uncomfortable. We'll call the cops. Call uptown. them. Call them. Call them. Go to right uptown. Now. Stop it. Call them. You call them. Go to uptown, dude. You call I'm them. Not. Let's see who's going to get off. This wasn't all. It's not my home. And I literally pulled over in the middle of the sidewalk and won't drive me home. No. No, there's nothing happening. Are you? Can you open the door? Get me out! I can't leave. It's not opening, you dumb. I. Please send the police, a black man has punched me. Please send the police, put up the picture. It's so sad. Jill Burquist was initially charged after screaming racial slurs at a black Uber driver, Wesley Gakuo. Then calling the Minneapolis Police Department to falsely accuse him of physical assault. Here's what happened after the video ended. Ms. Burquist made no request for emergency medical personnel. And when police arrived, they saw no signs that she was physically hurt. Even though she claimed the Uber driver, that the driver struck her on the left side of her face. The driver was not cited. Statements from both parties, both the driver and Burquist spoke with Minnesota Star Tribune. Burquist admitted that she should have never called the driver racial slurs, but did not back down from her claims that he held her down and hit her. The mother also chimed in and said her daughter, quote, didn't do anything wrong. Adding that the driver, quote, did not take the designated route to the home. The driver's 47 told the Star Tribune that he was never experienced, he has never experienced a racist verbal outburst since moving to Minnesota. He's originally from Kenya, but moved to the States in 1999. 
He also said he doesn't hold any hard feelings against Berquist. Let me go to the charges. It took Berquist more than a year to be charged because prosecutors did not learn of the incident until this past May. Berquist, 38 years of age, was initially charged with falsely reporting a crime and disorderly conduct. That means that the police did not do it, okay? Uh, and uh, both of those are misdemeanors. However, the Minneapolis City Attorney's Office dropped her first charge of falsely reporting a crime and has yet to say why. Her first court appearance was on July 11, and her court date is actually set for September 20th. Put up the picture of the city attorney. Kristen Anderson is the Minneapolis city attorney. Now, Kristen, in situations like this, when you have what we call overwhelming public interest, typically there's a, well, let's just say a massaging of the information. We don't like that. There's a spin of the narrative. We don't like that either. And so people like myself and others, we work hard to get to the truth. This energy does not have to be dispensed in such a way if you simply provide the evidence up front or explanation as to why things were dropped. We can save the back and forth and simply deal with the facts of your actions. We will continue to stay on this until there is full adjudication because what she did could have could have gotten this man killed. He could have died. And until we start dealing with these things as they are presented, we will always have a significant inequity as it relates to law enforcement and community. My distance of thoughts. Yeah, it's a crime to place a false 911 call, but we know how often things go awry before that caller can even be held accountable. A lot of times by the time that accountability is even there, it's already too late. So this type of behavior needs to be discouraged from happening in the first place. The laws that already exist against it need to be enforced. People who do things like this need to know that they will not be protected for their bad behavior, but they're never gonna know if they keep getting off. There you go, well said, we got more. On the other side, it's indisputable, stick and stay. All right, welcome back. We got a lot of show left. Let me read some of these amazing comments. Mickey see the silver haired dragon. Just two weeks ago today, the Supreme Court took away water rights from the Navajo Nation on their own land. Very dry, arid area. Now during a heat wave, the indigenous are denied water from their own land. We've never honored our treaties, why start now? It is so true, it is so true. C. Michael Henson, thank you again, C. Michael. I honestly believe that racist people hate people of color more than they love their own families. May have a point. Um, Shiva Mahadev, some, excuse me, same claims caused unjust massacres in the past, some claims. Caused or same claims caused unjust massacres in the past that should be assault to make such claims. We got to get it out of the misdemeanor realm. We have to get it out of there. And the reason is because typically we judge a crime to be a misdemeanor felony based on the adverse impact it has on society. Uh, claiming somebody falsely did something criminal to you, weaponizing your tears and your race, etc. Well, that should be more than, let's say, a $500 penalty, okay? C. Michael Henson, thank you again. Uh, no charges, they should make this a felony, boom, exactly, my point, that's right. And Lady, oh, okay, Lady, I got you, F and T, that's how I'm gonna say it, because I, I can't say it the other way, but I get what you did, I like it actually. Welcome to Indisputable, thank you so much for joining the membership team. Okay, a Republican, actually a bunch of them, about 14 total, they hate black folks so much that they are willing to sponsor a bill that if a state, a county, or even a municipality, if they give a penny of money to black people in the guise or under the guise of reparations, it should eliminate all federal funding from ever coming to that entire state forever. Put up the picture. I mean, that's some hate. Texas Republicans in the House are not simply threatening the loss of federal funding for lawmakers who support reparations for black residents. They have now introduced a bill to do just 
that the 13 co-sponsored bill introduced by Brian Babin would prohibit the federal government from providing financial assistance or bailouts to states, local counties, or municipalities if they support reparation laws that are associated with descendants of slaves. Now remember, in the bill itself, it makes the distinction. We're not talking about reparations. We're only talking about reparations as it relates to descendants of slaves, but they're not racist. This is one of the most insane bills, and that's saying something in this era that you will hear. There's more. According to Babin's bill, the US government, including the Federal Reserve System and independent agencies, may not provide any loan, any grant, or other form of financial assistance to the government of any state or political subdivision thereof, or any agency or instrumentality of such a state or political subdivision that enacts into law any program providing reparations on the basis of what? Slavery, slavery or race or ethnicity, national origin or historical practices related thereto, related to what? Slavery, that's it. Just black people, he should have just said it. We don't want Negroes getting nothing. So anything related to Negroes and money, they can't get it or your whole state gets no money from us. As if it's their money in the first place. You realize that black people pay taxes, right? You do realize that our allies pay taxes, right? And that those who are adversely impacted, well, you're also deciding to adversely impact individuals that may even support you. It is insanity on top of insanity, as I say, but there's more. American taxpayers, according to him, should not be forced to pay for radical race-based reparation payments to please the woke left. Babin told Fox News, my bill ensures the government entities enacting reparation laws based on race, ethnicity, national origin of slavery cannot receive federal bailouts, Babin said. America actually likes reparations and bailouts. We've given reparations to Native Americans, not to the tune that they deserve. We've given reparations to many groups, including the Japanese and Jews. We've given bailouts to banks, car industries. But as soon as the conversation starts, and I mean conversation because the only thing we really have is a commission to study reparations. And we can't even get that funded. A commission to study reparations has caused a new commission of Republicans to say everybody who engages in this type of action will have the federal government oppose them. Isn't it ironic that the same party who once told us they are for small government, that they do not want the federal government or other big government taking over small local jurisdictions are doing just that as it relates to stopping black folk from receiving any form of reparations at all. There's more, let's put it up seemingly an act of retaliation. The bill comes after Texas representative introduces a bill to commission study and develop reparations proposals for black residents. Other states and cities have already taken steps toward reparations, via proposals, discussions of logistics and cash amounts, and some have already paid money. California has finalized a proposal for reparations for black residents. Evanston, Illinois has already paid some money to residents with this restorative housing fund. The fund allocates $25,000 worth of housing improvements, mortgage assistance or down payments to black residents who lived in Evanston between 1919 and 1969. You have colleges who have engaged in very similar practices, but those colleges were built by black folk who could not reap the benefits of their labor. Keep in mind, please, reparations is not a handout. Reparations is a debt settled, is what it should be. I want you to look at this historically. The labor that was forced should have been paid labor. Even if they labored and received a barter agreement, it should have been compensated. 
but because it was not. My great, 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 great grandfather who was enslaved in this country died with nothing. His wife died with nothing, separated, ripped from him. If they would have been compensated, they would have had land and money to pass to that generation. That generation would have had land and money to pass to the next and so on. Black folk are in this routine of systematic dysfunction that none of us signed up for. Cities like San Francisco and Providence, Rhode Island are considering redress for black residents. San Francisco has discussed 5 million one time cash payments for residents while Providence is considering grant funding instead of direct cash payments. And because of these conversations, all of a sudden they want to shut the entire damn government down per state who engages in such conversations and enacting policies to support reparations for black people only. Yasmin thoughts. Yeah, uh, this is my congressperson. Uh, Brian Babin, for the record, no, I did not vote for him. Babin, he is a dentist. He's a Trump supporter. He voted to overturn the 2020 election results. He's terrible. And it makes sense that he would do something like this. But the thing about Texas politicians is that they love to do these things in the dark. They love to act secretly because they hate to deal with any kind of backlash. Babin's district doesn't represent Houston specifically, just a, a small part at the bottom, but it is Houston adjacent. And Houston has a major black population, and we do have a history of slavery in and around Houston. We don't talk about it very often, but we do. Uh, the bigger problem here is that Babin isn't doing this because he's worried about, you know, say the the logistics of something like reparations. That's a conversation. That's a conversation that's worth having. That's the conversation that we are trying to have. And he's doing this because he doesn't even want that conversation to take place in the first place. And he wants to make sure that no one else can have the conversation, whether or not he's a part of it. It's really, it's really terrible. It's insane. But we are here now. Sorry, sorry about Babin. We tried to get him voted out, but it's really difficult. Well, I think hopefully now. Some more energy will come to help you all in this re-election bid. Um, I got an update. Yep, I got an update of a cop who locked up his three-year-old son. That cop is now on administrative leave, and we have more information. Put up the picture full mass. I knew it was there. Per department memo, Daytona Beach Shores, Florida Police. Lieutenant Michael Schoenbrod has been placed on administrative leave pending the results of a professional standards investigation. Should be under, under criminal review. It's the third such investigation the lieutenant has faced in the last 10 months. Months, not years, months. The newest allegations against him relate to taking or tampering with public safety records and altering or distributing digital recordings without authorization. The memo cites three code of conduct policy violations that may have occurred on or after April 7th, 2023. First reads, and I quote, employees shall not commit any act or crime defined by state or federal laws of felony, whether chargeable or not. Another. Employees shall not steal, alter, or forge, or tamper with any kind of public safety record, report, or citation. It goes on to the state, it goes on to state, excuse me, that the unlawful or unauthorized removal of any such document is prohibited. The last state's employees, quote, will not edit, alter, erase, duplicate, copy, share, or otherwise distribute in any manner digital recordings without prior written authorization, end quote. Put up the picture of how this family was introduced to us. Now remember, they both locked up their three year old son. We're talking about the Lieutenant and his wife, Sergeant Jessica Long. They faced an internal and external investigation after he told the Florida Department of Children and Families, that they on consecutive days took their three year old son to one of the city's jail cells because 
he pottied the wrong way. And so they locked him up, put handcuffs on him and everything. And admitted to doing it and said, hey, we did it to our other son too. No criminal arrest. The conclusion of that investigation, as well as records of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and Daytona Beach Shores have been under seal after the couple petitioned the court to seal it. Um, put up the picture again. I'm going to tell you why the court probably sealed it. Uh, naturally, they're going to look out for the police, but there is a provision in the law that allows you to seal things like this if a judge agrees so that it does not embarrass the children. All right. So that is probably the auspices of their reason for sealing it. Then in April, after an April 7th briefing, Schoenbrod faced allegations of violating six department policies, including treating others with respect, avoiding conflicts of interest and favoritism, and avoiding rumors and other conduct that diminishes morale. Uh, Schoenberg typically does not attend those briefings at the briefing. Schoenbrod spoke critically of other officers and he believed uh, who he believed were involved in reporting him to the Florida Department of Children and Families and the Department of Law Enforcement, the former employee said, put him up. Um, so Schoenbrod's position as Lieutenant places him directly beneath Michael Fowler. Michael Fowler is the Director of Public Safety pictured on the right in the department's chain of command. So this individual has significant rank. According to the Daytona Beach News Journal, this cop has been with the department for approximately 23 years. And based on his earnings in the first six months of 2023, he was on pace to bring home roughly $100,000. This is your best and brightest. Your protectors? No, these individuals are petty. Many of them are cowards. And until there's a collective voice from within law enforcement, from men and women who actually currently have on the uniform, I get it. A lot of you retire and then tell the truth, or you get fired and then become honest. Be honest when you're there. Say something. Stand up. It's happening in front of you. All right, thoughts. Yeah, this story epitomizes the fact that some people really shouldn't be in charge of anyone else, whether that's a child as a parent or an entire community as a cop. Not everyone is qualified to be judging and punishing others. And this man is clearly not qualified to be a child's caretaker. But now he's got time off from work with pay for jailing his toddler. He's on administrative leave for something that's clearly not his first violation. So maybe all of these paid administrative leaves aren't doing enough to teach these cops any lessons. They're not being rehabilitated or reprimanded or punished in any significant or impactful way. This guy just got a vacation for doing something terrible. Why wouldn't he keep doing terrible? Terrible things. Right. And then he comes and talks about the cops who turned him in. You're damn right they turned you in because you're a horrible leader. All right. We got more on the other side. It's indisputable stick and stay. All right. Welcome back. We have a lot of show left. A horrific scene, unavoidable. Um, or avoidable is the question. I want you to look at it. We're going to discuss. Here it is. Yo, turn off the car. Turn it off. Yeah, it's in your hand, right there. Yes, sir. Okay, in this hand and that hand. My bad. Now, give me that. Give me the other one and put your hands on the steering wheel right now. My bad. Don't move. Put your hands on the steering wheel. Put your hands on the steering wheel. Are you guys good? Yeah. Guess you? Yeah, I did. Don't move. Put your hands on the steering wheel. 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 Stop! 
Are you guys good? Yeah. You guys shoot? Put up the picture full mass. Jose Velez confronts and shoots Derek Diaz. The family and loved ones of the 26 year old Derek Diaz who was fatally shot last week by Orlando, Florida police. Say viewing officers body camera footage has only left them with more questions and not more answers. Diaz was shot in the early morning hours of July 3rd after he was approached by several officers while sitting in a parked car. According to the body camera footage released Wednesday by the Orlando Police Department. Orlando police officer Jose Velez can be seen approaching Diaz from the driver's side of the car. After briefly speaking with Diaz, who appears to be complying, Velez opens the car door while telling Diaz to put his hands on the steering wheel. Diaz then reaches his right hand toward the vehicle center console before Velez fires what sounds like a single shot, it could be more. Less than a minute passes between the officer approaching Diaz and the shot being fired, the video shows. Officers rendered aid to Diaz until first responders arrived and transported him to a hospital where he was then pronounced dead. According to the family attorney, let's put her up, Natalie Jackson. The footage was shown to Diaz's family before its release, but offered them little closure. Jackson said, what we saw in the video left more questions than answers. Among those questions, she said, is why the police initially approached Diaz in the first place. Jackson said the video shows Diaz sitting peacefully in a legally parked car when he was aggressively approached by three armed police officers in less than one minute he was shot. Jackson said Wednesday that Diaz was unarmed and there was not a gun in his vehicle. There was no gun in the middle console anywhere else. In a statement released with the body camera footage, police said Diaz tossed an object out of the window after he was shot. That was later identified as narcotics. Now, let me put the attorney's picture up again and explain why she's even saying why was he approached? Because if he was illegally approached, everything from that moment becomes unlawful. That's the reason she's bringing that to your attention, okay? Orlando Police Chief Eric D. Smith said in a statement, officers patrolled to remove drugs and guns from Orlando streets. Adding that the intersection near where Diaz was confronted had seen 431 incidents in the last 18 months. Sir, that does not negate civil rights. Smith and his department understand the need for answers, but maintaining the integrity of the investigation process is also needed so that the facts are provided fairly and transparently. Velez has been placed on administrative leave and the department is cooperating with a Florida Department of Law Enforcement investigation into the incident, Smith said. The department also said it will conduct its own internal investigation. Now you did have multiple cops on the scene. No other police officer felt that their lives were in danger. Nobody was shot. You have one cop who decided to pull the trigger. There's no gun. He seemed to be complying. You can't even argue he was trying to get away. Why? Because there is no getaway steering wheel in the console. In the middle console, there is no getaway. He may have been simply trying to comply even further and got killed. Thoughts? Yeah, you know, body cam footage is very hard to argue with. And, you know, why did this escalate as quickly as it did? Why is shooting someone the only and first option that cops seem to have for detaining people? I don't understand how people will still defend the cop in situations like this one. You know, we kind of know what they're gonna say. You know, what was he reaching for? What if he was reaching for a gun? And what if he shot the cop first? What if it was too late for the cop? But why was the cop opening his car door in the first place? These situations are kind of scary because what could you do if you were in Derek's situation? If you were the one sitting in the car, what could you do to avoid getting shot? You could comply. He was apparently complying, so he wasn't doing anything unlawful. Maybe he had narcotics, I don't know if that's real or what, but hopefully more answers come out in the future. Yep, there you go, we will continue to follow this case. All right, Uh, presidential candidate, former governor Nikki Haley does not love her husband. Well, at least not all the time. She kind of loves him the way she loves Donald Trump, here it is. What, What changed yours to not go on the attack, I mean, you're a little, 
you know, less direct than that, but but to, to question Donald Trump more, knowing that you risk the wrath of his of his voters and supporters who are pretty much in lockstep with him and, and make up a large part of the Republican base right now. Neil, his voters and supporters and the American people want the truth. I just speak hard truths. You've got some people who are mad that I don't love Trump 90, you know, 100 percent of the time. I don't love my husband 100 percent of the time. You've got some people who are upset that I don't disagree with him 100 percent of the time. I think he was the right president at the right time. I call it like I see it. Uh, let's put up a picture of the husband. Um, sir, your wife does not love you 100 percent of the time. And you look to be a decent fella, okay? But your wife, sir, loves you the same way she loves Donald Trump. I just want you to marinate on that for a minute, sir. Uh, let's put up the polling numbers. Um, the polling numbers that you see, uh, they indicate she has no chance in hell. All right, Yasmin, thoughts? Yeah, I almost covered this for the breakdown, but I like kind of didn't really know what to say about it. It's weird and it's uncomfortable and it's an unnecessary way to make the point that she was trying to make. Nikki Haley feels untrustworthy and opportunistic to me and I don't think that I'm alone in that assessment of her. She still won't say that she doesn't support Donald Trump because she knows that she'll have to fall in line behind him if and right. when Trump becomes a 2024 Republican nominee. So it all just feels very disingenuous. And I don't know why she had to bring her husband into all this, but I feel sad for him. Man, the lady threw her husband under the bus. It's not necessary. In order to show her love for Trump somehow. It's just weird. All right, always a pleasure having you on the program. Tell people how they can follow you, check out your great work. <clears throat> yeah, you can follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and Threads now um, at Yaz K Y A Z Z Z Z Z K. And also, you can find my content on the TYT breakdown. Always a pleasure, dear sister. Thank you for all you do. Thanks for having me. Bye. All right, the bullpit is next. Stick and stay. All right, welcome back. Always good to be with you. We got a lot of comments. I'm going to read a couple, kind of press for time. Um, square peg in a round hole says, too many police officers these days are afraid of their own shadows. The idea that officers can get away with killing somebody under the pretense of being in fear of their lives needs to stop. Unless the person is actually pointing a weapon in their direction. This needs to be stopped immediately because too many people have died because police officers were afraid to do their job. That's right. Um, try to tell you. These folks are scary, all right? Uh, many of them are cowards. Fritza Jaquez, uh, thank you for that, by the way. My heart hurt so badly for that young man's family. I know he was complying. He complied the whole damn time. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. Oh, we have a treat in the bullpen today. We have one of my colleagues at Sirius XM, Urban View. Remarkable individual, Reese Colbert. She is host of the Reese Colbert Show and has a lot of background. Best selling author, speaker, advocate, political strategist, renowned for her unbossed and unfiltered delivery. We appreciate what she does for the culture and the country. Reese, good day. Welcome to Indisputable. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Ritchie. Well, we're glad to have you here. We're gonna chop it up about this element going down in California. Mm -hmm. There's an appointment opportunity, governor has this authority. Uh, there are some political entanglements that I don't think has been exposed as much as it should. Right. So I'm going to give you the floor to explain to us what is happening inside of the political ranks with this appointment. Well, as you all know, Senator Dianne Feinstein has experienced some health issues. She had an extended leave in the Senate for a couple of months and people were wondering if she was going to return. Things were complicated by the fact that Governor, Governor Gavin Newsom kind of punted the ball in terms of appointing a black woman to replace Senator then Senator Kamala Harris, now Vice President Kamala Harris, into that being a pledge he made if Senator Dianne Feinstein were not able to fill out her term. And so with her health challenges, the discussion 
situation kind of came up again. And you know, based on what I've been told firsthand and based on what's been reported in in, in uh, magazines like Variety, or, I'm sorry, um, Vanity Fair, uh, there have been some calculations and some you know willing and dealing behind the scenes to try to block. Congresswoman Barbara Lee from getting that appointment. She is running against Congresswoman Katie Porter and Congressman Adam Schiff, who has a lot of the establishment backing. And so they do not want, a lot of people do not want to see her have that advantage of incumbency by getting that appointment. Now, Senator Dianne Feinstein is still there. She's back in the Senate, so this might be a moot point. But I do take issue with the notion that incumbency advantages is all of a sudden a problem when it comes to a black woman. When there was no problem when Senator Alex Padilla was appointed to backfill Senator, or now Vice President Kamala Harris. That part, that part. And I'm going to expand it into a macrocosm just for a moment. Mm -hmm. Because my dear sister Reese made an impeccable point that must be understood by everyone. When let's say a black person runs for political office and they lose, especially in a southern state, they will say, well, um, it's because we picked a black candidate. Right. Okay. And then mm -hmm. there's all of a sudden this, this prohibition to picking a black candidate as your nominee the next time because a black person lost. However, do the math, more white men have lost political office than any other demographic in the United States of America. Hello. And you have never heard a narrative that said this person lost because we decided to choose a white male. You mm -hmm. don't hear that narrative. You only hear a different nuanced narrative when the individual happens to be a person of color. In this case, the individual happens to be a person of color and a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I get the point and I understand it completely. It seems as if there's a push and pull uh, for those, even some of our allies to understand these nuances as well. So I want you to speak to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a whole notion of electability um, when yep. it comes to black politicians that white politicians are not held to. If we look at a lot of the competitive seats in the tw year 2020, when Biden Harris were the ticket, there were a lot of white women, to be honest, that did not win those competitive seats, and the, their opponents were white women in those states. And so, um, you know, but there hasn't been a push to say, hey, let's stop nominating white women uh, to run for these Senate seats. And so, I don't think that Senator Barbara Lee, or sorry, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, has an electability problem. She has a competitive, she has a, she has a, she can actually win problem that people are trying to stop. Because even with the fact that she is vastly out fundraised, her opponents have tens of millions of dollars in fundraising, a whole lot more establishment behind them. And she has hundreds of thousands, maybe a million at this point, I don't know. And yet she still gained significant ground in the polling. When she first started out, the pundits and the and the writers loved to say that she was a distant third polling in single digits. But a new poll just came out that showed her just three points behind Adam Schiff, who is three points behind Katie Porter, all of them hmm. within 19, 16, and 13 points. So this is a wow. competitive race. And for her to be this competitive with no money, it reminds me of now Mayor Karen Bass, who went up hmm. against the juggernaut. Rick Caruso, who threw $100 million and still lost. And so people are afraid of her, and that's why she's not getting the kind of backing that she needs to get. And that's why they do not want to see her get this appointment should Dianne Feinstein step aside. Wow, electability politics is something quite interesting. I broke this down to my college students about electability because that all comes comes down to a psychological construct. Mm -hmm. Electability is a psychological construct. Uh, and we are psychologically a combination of three E's, experiences, exposures, and environments. That's what we are, experiences, exposures, and environments. Look at what Republicans did with Trump. Mm. Trump seemed to be the most unelectable man on the face of the damn planet, okay? Right. They decided to cast aside the electability argument. And they chose who they believed would be their champion. Mm. That excitement was tangible enough to make him president of the United States for at least one term. We have not done that on the left. Progressive policies and dynamics associated with democratic officials have kept those people quite silent. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there's an electability argument, it's treated as if it's a real conversation. It is a psychological construct, it's a restriction of your own thinking placed upon you by the atmosphere of politics by the powers that be. That's all it is. So right. now you have this electability argument again, right in front of your face. But the person, as you have just laid out very clearly, uh, is not only competitive, can probably 
uh, take over the field if she had comparable funding. And mm-hmm. that takes us back to another macrocosm, which is uh, money inside of politics. I don't like money in politics. Definitely don't like it in the version that we do in America because it does not create an equal playing field for those who actually want to serve. What are your thoughts about massive money inside of the political realm? Well, yeah, I mean, the reality is that black candidates have a much harder time raising money because yeah. we do not have that institutional support. We don't necessarily have the networks where it's a blank check if you decide that you want to run. And so that's a huge disadvantage that definitely impacts us disproportionately. Um, I do think that there is a bigger push throughout the Democratic Party to have this grassroots fundraising, but grassroots does not necessarily mean organic. It mm. takes money to raise money. And so if you're starting off with less, then you get a less opportunity to raise grassroots funding because you don't have the mailing list and you don't have the millions of dollars to spend to raise another $10 million. So it's not just as simple as saying get big money out. It's also a matter of what you're starting off with that makes the difference. Very well said, very well said. Um, I want people to uh, get to know you better, right? This is your first time on my show and to understand some of your platform dynamics. Tell people how they can check out your content and you got a game. Uh, I want to get into this because oh, yeah. what my producers told me, I thought it was quite fascinating. So let's talk about that as well. But yes. tell people how they can check you out. So I do have a board game I created. It's actually a segment on my show, The Reese Colbert Show, which airs Saturdays at 3 p.m. on Sirius XM Urban View, the same channel you're on, Dr. Richie. Yeah. Um, and so basically the game is like, it's, it's it's a scenarios game, it's a fun party game where you read off the scenario, it's a hypothetical, and then you determine who's tripping. I kind of kind of fashion it about like, am I the a-hole? But you know, black people, we don't say that, we say, am I tripping? And so right. that's where the game <laughs> came from. I do a segment on my show, I'm actually doing live shows. Clay Kane and I just launched a tour and we're gonna have that as part of the segment. So the website is amitrippinggame.com. And then my website is reesecobert.com. That's how you can keep up with me and my Sirius XM show. I do all kinds of content outside of that. So yeah, that's that's in a nutshell. Your show is um, is awesome. Oh, thank all right. you. It is a fun, authentic, and refreshing show. So um, for those who would like to follow you on social media, how can they do so? So on social media, I'm Reese Cobert on Twitter, Instagram, Threads now, TikTok, and on YouTube, it's Black Women Views and Facebook Black Women Views. My dear sister, we appreciate all you do. Thank you Thank so you. much. My pleasure. All right. Remember, take care of yourself, take care of each other, take care of the planet. Remember, the truth is always indisputable. Indisputable has been named the fastest growing news TV show in the United States of America. Compared to all shows on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, and roughly 30 others. What do we do on this show? We tell the truth. You know why we tell the truth? Because the truth is simply indisputable. Donald Trump radicalized citizens. He's the chief terrorist. Republicans still want you to think that critical race theory is the greatest evil that can happen in K through 12 education. It's not even talk. I guarantee you this, David, if he would have taken a knee during the national anthem to bring awareness to the need for more money for cancer research in America, he would not have had that response. It was the fact that he took a knee for black folk and brown folk. You rather pick the voters because you're scared of the voters picking the politicians. It frightens you, but we coming. When you are in a privileged position, equality looks like oppression to you. The Karenicity runs deep in this one. We provide a mirror, a mirror for reflection and a mirror for correction. So what if I have 35? Don't hit me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. So let's put up the graphic of this Karen in peak performance. Boom. They want anarchy so they can start creating their own rules. Can you share with me some examples? When they were running around during the terrorist attack on January 6th saying hang Mike Pence. 
So those are the people I'm talking about. That's a problem, correct? You work for Mike Pence, stand up for the guy. Do not allow the ideology of politics to evaporate the humanity that still exists inside of you. They don't stop, I don't stop. Racism won't stop, I won't stop. Systemic bias won't stop, so I won't stop. People still need health care, so I won't stop. People still need criminal justice systems reformed in this country, so I won't stop. And you won't stop either.